Welcome to the Cherry Becker Tax Beat, a conversation about tax that matters. Welcome to this edition of Cherry Becker Tax Beat Podcast. Just a few months ago, we discussed an overview of the proposed rules for beneficial ownership information reporting, uh, also referred to as BOI reporting. Uh, we now have final re regulations from Treasury with important updates and effective dates. So we'll talk about what these changes were and when reporting will be required. Uh, joining us again in today's conversation is Mike Cornett, a director with our firm's international tax group. Hello, Mike. How's it going today? Good, Brooks. Good morning to you as well. Uh, it's, I'm calling in from St. Louis today, and we've uh, finally got our first taste of winter here this morning, so it's a little on the chilly side. Oh, no. Oh, no. And as always, uh, Sarah McGregor, director and our firm, joining me from Greenville, South Carolina. How's life Hi. treating you, Sarah? Life is good here. Uh, we're past the October 17 filing deadline, so everyone is breathing a sigh of relief. And like Mike, we have our first taste of fall and, and some chilly weather this morning, which is great. Wait a minute, Sarah. Fall does not equal winter. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, uh, I, hear, I hear you. We've had some very pleasant autumn weather up here in Richmond where I'm sitting as well. Okay, so let's jump into our topic, the Corporate Transparency Act, also because uh, we love acronyms, CTA, was passed into a law effective January 1, 2021. CTA was part of a larger Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2021. So CTA requires most business entities registered to conduct business in the U.S. to report information about the entity's so-called beneficial owners to the Department of the Treasury. So all this is a big mouthful for sure. So specifically, CTA requires certain domestic and foreign held business entities to identify and provide personal information about their owners or key management personnel to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, uh, commonly referred to as FinCEN, and that's a division of the Treasury. So the goal of CTA is to limit the use of shell companies to hide actual individual owning or controlling activities that may evade tax or may be criminal. Uh, information collected by FinCEN may be shared with other governmental agencies, law enforcement, financial institutions, and regulators. So again, all this is going after shell corporations and tax evasions. And I think as we discussed last time, uh, the United States is you know one of the largest centers of shell corporations and tax evasions despite all the um literature about uh tax havens uh, you know being off in nice corp caribbean islands etc cetera, etc cetera. so all right so let's we'll start with you sarah when will boi be re required at this point in time Right. So one of the good things that came about in the final regulation is that the effective date for the regulation is not until January 1, 2024. So that is when the reporting requirement time starts, time clock starts, and all existing entities uh, as of in existence as of January 1 of 2024 will have one year to file their initial report with FinCEN. Uh, we don't have those forms yet. We don't have the filing uh, system in place yet, but that gives the Treasury um, a year to finalize that and get that information out to taxpayers. Uh, so all existing entities will have to file before the end of 2024. They'll have that 12 month period. Any new entities created after on or after January 1 of 2024 will have 30 days to fill out their initial report. So uh, for a company that was form, gets formed on uh, December 24th of 2023, they will have 12 months to file their initial report. But if a company is formed on January 2nd of 2024, they will have only 30 days uh, to keep that in mind uh, to, to get ready to go there. One of the other nice things is that we've given, been given a better date for making changes and updates um, on, on there. And I think we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, 
Sarah, to the best of our knowledge, is this going to be a paper form? Uh, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know. I think it, if it is a paper form, there will probably be an electronic filing system, much like the uh, uh, the foreign bank account reporting forms, uh, the the form one one four that is filed to FinCEN. Uh, it's a it is a paper form, but they do request it to be electronically filed. This may be a system where companies go in and file directly with FinCEN to file their information and, and update and have a login to that database. We just don't know yet. They haven't uh, completed the work on what that um, connectivity will be in filing system. All right, Mike. Um, so looking at these new regulations, what change were made to the entities that are required to report BOI information? Yeah, in terms of the entities that are required to report Brooks, I would say the changes were not major. I mean, they were more what I would call in the forms of clarifications. So just to you know refresh everyone's memory, you have you know, basically two concepts here: a domestic reporting company and a foreign reporting company. Uh, you know, and the domestic reporting company is you know, and it is created by filing. A you know, document with the secretary or state or a similar office with the state, you know, or tr a tribal government, and a foreign reporting company is a foreign entity that is registered to, registered to do business in the United States. So those concepts did not change. What they did indicate, though, is there were questions about whether a general partnership, a sole proprietorship, because they might be filing paperwork with a state, whether that would qualify as a reporting company. They clarified it in general that the answer to that is no. So if you have a general partnership or sole proprietorship, the fact that you might have registered, you know, a doing business name or something with the state shouldn't subject you to these rules. Um, the other area was, you know, they provide 23 categories of entity types or entities engaged in certain activities that are exempt from the rules. They really didn't change that. They're still at 23. But again, they provided some clarification uh, to help uh, do it. You know, just to give you an example, you know, they used to say FinCEN registered money transmitting business. Now they realize they need to change this to money service business. So again, a clarification. Um, probably, you know, another clarification was um, they had a category called entities owned or controlled by each of the, you know, an exempted entity. So if you had a top tier company that was exempt, uh, now they allow you to push that exemption down to any wholly owned subsidiaries or entities underneath that entity. So, you know, that was a good clarification. So you didn't have to say every entity and let's say a consolidated group might have its own. Um, on the exemption for large operating companies, uh, those pretty much stayed the same. Again, they clarified a couple things to make it clear that when it comes to the employee test, which is, you know, you employ more than 20, more than 20 employees on a full-time basis, that's done on an entity by entity basis. So, you know, if we had a client who had a, a privately held company and they have a holding company at the top, you know, they may not have employees in that holding company. So that holding company may end up being a reporting company, but then maybe one of the wholly owned entities underneath might qualify on their own because they might meet the rest of the exceptions, which is $5 million in gross receipts. And you have a physical you know, presence in the United States. So, And Mike, Mike that employee test is, is really on full-time employees. It, you can't uh, combine part-time employees to make full-time equivalents here. Correct, Sarah, yeah. I mean, it's a full-time employee and it does look to the IRS rules and what are full-time employees for that. So um, people asked for that to be done on more of a consolidated or group basis, but the IRS reject, or sorry, Treasury rejected that comment uh, that they said it has to be on an entity by entity approach. Yes, and most HR systems now talk about FTEs, you know, full-time equivalents. So, but we couldn't make anything simple. Let's have to go out and do another calculation. All right. Yeah. All right. So, Mike, um, so uh, who who are we reporting on under BOI? What has changed in, in, in the regulations on the WHO piece? Yeah, on, on the WHO piece, um, you know, again, the, the concept is based upon this beneficial owner. And again, it's targeting individuals. So it's looking for an individual who directly or indirectly through, uh, you know, con you know, and I'll, it's contract arrangement, understanding, you know, a whole list of, you know, 
legalese type terms, you know, either owns, um, you know, either exercises substantial control over that reporting company or owns or controls at least 25% of the ownership interest of the reporting company. Uh, one thing they did there is they clarified that, uh, you know, it was unclear when you had intermediate entities in between, you know, people thought the rules were going to say so you look through and they did clarify that that an individual may own or control a reporting company through ownership of or control of intermediate and entities. So, you know, you'll have to look through a chain of entities potentially to figure out who the reporting, you know, what individual has to be reported as a beneficial owner. Um, well, that, they, well, that's going to, I'm sorry. Well, that's going to be a lot of fun because now we're sitting here trying to pick out and you know, uh, accept certain entities from being reported or having to deal with it. But you have to go back in through some of that stuff anyway to pick, you know, to analyze if they're still a beneficial owner. Anyway. Yeah, so there, there, there's going to be a, there's going to be a lot of legwork, a lot of information gathering uh, in terms of the substantial control, you know, um, the proposed regs talked about a senior officer of the reporting company would have substantial control. They did provide some clarification to make it clear that a somebody who holds the position of the secretary or the treasurer uh, is not going to be viewed as a senior officer for purposes of exercising substantial control. So at least took a couple of people out that you might have to report depending on your organizational structure. Uh, and then, you know, the thing that they did make it clear, it is still, you have to report all those individuals who have, you know, substantial control or who are beneficial owners with substantial control. So you, you just don't report one. People had asked, hey, can we just report one? No, you got to report everyone. So again, one entity could have, you know, three, four, five, six, you know, depending on their structure, people that they have to report on. All right. So we've talked about when, we've talked about who, so let's talk about what. Sarah, uh, what do we now know about what information we have to report on all the people that are included, the entities and the owners? Uh, it really hasn't changed, Brooks. Uh, each beneficial owner, the information that's going to have to be reported includes their full legal name, their date of birth, their current residential street address, uh, and an ID number that comes from a driver's license or a passport or some other legal document, uh, uh, identifying document, as well as a copy of that document. So there, you're going to have to give both the number and a copy of that document to make sure that you've identified the particular person who is that beneficial owner. So that's some uh, pretty important information for those individuals, beneficial owners who operate through a number of entities, um, through funds that hold multiple entities that might have multiple reporting uh, situations, those beneficial owners can go directly to the FinCEN or will be able to when the reporting information is available, can go and register themselves, provide that information, and then they'll be given assigned a number, a, a beneficial owner information reporting number. They can then, those individuals can give that number to all of the entities that have to fill out BOI reporting, and they could just report that number because that individual is already on file with FinCEN. That individual then will be responsible for maintaining and updating their records and keeping those current with FinCEN, um, and the company will then just keep up with that individual number. So there, there is that simplification and, and potential protection for individuals who don't want to share uh, this information with uh, multiple, multiple companies that they may be direct and indirect owners of. Whoopee, so we can now get a, uh, now we can get I-10s and P-10s, and now we can get a BOI number too. So That's uh, right, something for everyone. <laughs> All right, um, so we talked about the uh, big picture timing of reporting. Sarah alluded to changes, so Mike, uh, what do we know about changes, which in many ways might have been the most problematic part about all of this stuff? Yeah, on, on the changes or, or corrections to it, you know, they, they had a host of rules. Some were 14 days, some were 30 days. So they uh, at least got consistent here. So everything now is, you know, 30 days, uh, you know, if, if you've had a change or you found out of a correction needs to be made, you have 30 days to, you know, amend your report and submit it, you know, which now is in line with the number of days you have to submit your report if you're a new entity, as we talked about earlier. 
come 1-1-2024, one, one, uh, you have 30 days to submit that report. So they went to just one 30-day period. So it's going to make it a lot easier, I think, to um, not have multiple reporting requirements, you know, because it's a change versus a correction. Uh, and so that that was really the big thing in this area. Uh, yeah, and it, and I will say, Mike, they they did clarify too that it is uh, when the change occurs and not when the company finds out about it. Yeah. Uh, to start that 30-day count. So if a, a beneficial owner changes their address, it is when that beneficial owner owner changes the address, not when the company is informed that the owner changed their address starts the 30-day count um, on on this. All right. Well, I'm going to be the first person to sit here and just state for the record, there's a about a 0% chance of compliance uh, with that kind of scenario uh, that uh, we think we're going to actually be picking up address changes of beneficial owners within 30 days. But uh, anyway. Great, I'll, I'll tell them where to send the $500 a day penalty <laughs> to you, Brooks. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> until yes. until coming back into compliance. That's where I think the reporting with uh, having those individuals register and, and be assigned a number with FinCEN takes some of that pressure off of the company That's because the now it is not up to the company to report that change. It is solely up to the individual to uh, to report that change. Yeah, so I can understand if the company's doing a reorg or restructure and ownership changes, they're aware of that. Um, but you know, having people just change their address, that's not going to be in the purview of the company being aware of that all the time. So, well, I think that's that's where we'll, you know, when we talk about what can companies do now, I think uh, making those requirements for regular reporting uh, an important part of owning a portion of the company, becoming a senior executive in the company. Uh, identifying that person with control, putting in measures in place within the company to make that an expected part of uh, what is required by those owners, whether it's in the, you know, the partnership agreement has that terminology in it, uh, or those requirements to report, um, or the uh, shareholder agreements for uh, S corporations, for foreign reporting companies, whatever the case may be, there needs to be some sort of mechanism to uh, help encourage, if not enforce, activity uh, among the owners to make sure that the companies can report timely or assign the penalties, if if any, are assessed back to those folks for failure to share information timely. Mm. I that we are. This is just going to be a very, 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 very uh, tangled up system to get to that level of compliance. Um, Hopefully there will be some leniency in the first year or so, year or two, um, if this still, if this, if this regime continues. All righty, Mike. What other good news can we expect to be coming from Treasury in the near future? Uh, yeah, I, I think you know over the course of the next, you know, the rest of this year and, and all of 2023, you know, I think we'll be getting information about how you're actually going to do these reports. You know, uh, you know, Treasury has to build. The reporting mechanisms, whether you know it's going to be uh, forms, some form of electronic filing, some combination of the both, uh, probably some discussion of how you will submit personal information into the treasury to make sure that it is secure. I'm sure there will be some, I would think, guidance on how you need to protect that personal information as well within your own systems. I mean, um, because uh, they'll just want to make sure that's being protected. And then I think I would expect there also maybe be some guidance how uh, Treasury may share this information with other government agencies, law enforcement, uh, you know, because that's part of the reason they're doing this is doing that. So, you know, over the course of next year, that, that has to all be worked out because they don't have a computer system right now that can handle all this data that's going to be submitted to them. That was actually one of the comments to Treasury saying, hey, you should delay this even longer because you don't have the systems. And Treasury says, no, we've been working on this since 2021. And so we're, we're you know, we'll be ready come 2024 to house it. So I think those are the biggest things we're, go we're going to see from them. Yeah, they'll be ready. They, they've gone out and rented another big warehouse that they can uh, land all, <laughs> keep off boxes of forms in there. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah. That was mean. That was just mean and uncalled for. Okay. Um, all right. So. 
Sarah, let's talk about what companies can and should, should be doing now. I mean, January 2024, it's not tomorrow. Um, and if we even look to 12 months beyond that, I mean, we're December 2024. So this is not a massive rush or urgent matter per se, but what um, what guidance should we be giving right now? Well, I think uh, one identifying which companies uh, are going to need to report and being clear on that. And then, as you noted, how, how are you going to collect the information and how are you going to protect that information and how are you going to document that changes are being made and who's going to be responsible? Uh, I think there's a lot of structural, there's some data management, data collection, data data security, uh, as well as who is going to take responsibility and be the point person for these filings. Uh, since they're, the updates are going to be within 30 days of a change, it's not like a tax return or an annual renewal with a state uh, for your, your franchise license or fee. Uh, there, there is no set filing once the initial filing is, has taken place. I think that's going to be a challenge for companies is to have a monitoring system to stay compliant. Don't you think it sure, sure would be a lot easier if they just made it an annual re reporting requirement on top of, you know? I, uh, I do. I think it would make a lot more sense to have an annual reporting, uh, much like they do for the foreign bank account reporting, right, right. Well, and just yeah. have it once a year and everybody updates their records. Uh, my guess is a lot of things can happen during a year, changes in ownership and events that uh, they're trying to capture so that um, whoever you are on on December 31 is also the person that owns the company on uh, the rest of the year. Yeah, and, I, yeah, I do understand you can get in and out and you can do all sorts of games just to avoid the December 31 right. uh, reporting date for sure. But it seems like they could do that as a backstop and at yeah. least the, have that as a good faith compliance. Yeah, the good news uh, is if, if nothing changes, companies could go years without having to make a change to their reporting. Well, except people move back to True. people do move. Yeah. Uh, yeah. OK. All right. Mike, any final words of wisdom on this topic? Yeah, I, I mean, I think at, at, at this point, kind of echoing Sarah's comments, I think companies need to really start focusing on this now to not only think about, you know, what information do we need to obtain? How do we need to get it? but as you start to enter into your joint ventures, think about what do I need to put into my contracts with my joint venture partners to ensure that I can get the information I need, you know, because it's, it's one thing to say I want it, but to put some sort of mechanism in place to ensure that other parties, not maybe under your control, who might meet that definition of a substantial owner, you know, will be kind of forced to provide you with that information. I think it's good to start thinking about how do I modify my existing agreements with you know third parties because foreign individuals are certainly going to be leery of providing information. Um, you know, it's always been a big issue here in the United States. Foreign individuals, uh, you know, have never liked giving up their information to the U.S. government. Uh, and so I, I think imagine why, why, yeah. why would they? Uh, why? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I think that's the other point I would make is that you need to start thinking about what do I need to do in my existing agreements to make sure I get the appropriate information, uh, you know, because there's going to be people who are going to be surprised that they're viewed as a beneficial owner, I think, of, of some of these entities because they have a lot more control than, you know, they may have thought they had. Right. And and the first time you, uh, uh, you, you don't want to be working on a change to your reporting in uh, 2024 as the first time you've practiced, what happens if somebody changes their address or uh, we change to a new CFO, um, how you handle that. This gives you time to practice and make sure that your systems are working to capture those changes and be ready and timely for reporting. Good point, good point. All right, anything else you'd like to add, sir? Uh, no, except that uh, we'll try to do a, a more extensive webinar uh, in the spring as we get within that one year of uh, the effective date to help people 
remind people again and go through some of these um, more onerous rules one more time. And hopefully we'll see more from, from Treasury by then as well. Yeah, we'll certainly do another podcast when we see, get news on the actual form the, uh, and more of the uh, procedural requirements. Okay, let's call it a wrap then. Uh, thank you for listening in today's podcast on the beneficial owner information reporting. And we got to learn all practice acronyms, I should say, BOI and FinCEN again, CTA as well. All right, a quick disclaimer that we are not providing tax advice on this podcast. Please consult with your tax advisor, hopefully at Cherry Beckert, with your specific tax issues or to discuss information from today's podcast. Check out the firm's website at cbh.com for the latest guidance and materials on this and other tax and business topics. This this concludes today's podcast. Please like, share, and subscribe. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, our listeners, for spending your time with us. We truly appreciate it. Let's call it a day and go forth in peace.